And let's pray. Thank you, God, for this night and for every single person that is here tonight. Lord, I pray, would you let them see you, Jesus, so that nobody would miss the incredible gift of Jesus tonight. And so, Lord, speak to us through your word and use the words that I speak and change them, Lord, however you need to, so that people hear, Lord, what you need them to hear. Lord, I pray it in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Well, I've always loved the Christmas story. It's Frankly, it's not a hard story to love because there's something for everybody in the Christmas story, uh, I, I believe. I mean, one, you've got a baby in the story. That's the central focus of the story, the baby Jesus. And everybody loves babies. I mean, who doesn't like a baby. I guess unless it's time to change the baby in a diaper, maybe that's the only time you don't. But babies are cute and they're adorable and, and so we love babies. And so this Christmas story has a baby in it. You like mysteries. Some of you are mystery kind of people. There's a great mystery. There is a virgin who has not married and never been with a man yet and now she is going to be pregnant with a child, a virgin birth. You like mysteries? It's got mystery in there. You like the supernatural? Well, we got angels coming out from heaven and appearing to shepherds in the fields. Um, there are angels supernaturally appearing and singing songs in the sky. You like supernatural? We got supernatural for you. You like underdogs? Um, there's no greater underdog than the shepherds. They were the bottom rung of society at that time. And so we've got underdogs if you like rooting for underdogs in the story. If you like astronomy, uh, there are stars um, that we talk about in the Christmas story. There really is something for every single person. And having grown up in the church and grown up hearing the story of Christmas after, you know, 50 years, you like to read it and, God, would you show me something new, maybe something I haven't seen before. And so I was looking at Mary in a little different Way And maybe it was because of the sermon series we were doing that even though I will, that I was looking uh, through the lens maybe in a little different way when I come, came across uh, Luke again. And, and maybe you've missed this part of it. And I just want to share it as sort of a launching off point tonight because there's a, a verse in Scripture that I think we just pass over so we can get to the rest of the story. And I don't want to miss it tonight. And it's in uh, the 28th verse of the Gospel of Luke, as he records, he said, an angel went to her, that's to Mary, and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, for the Lord is with you. Now, if you've heard the story before, you've probably heard those words before, but I want you to think about this for a moment, highly favored. Now, put yourself in Mary's shoes, if you would, for a moment. She's from a small town, and an angel appears to her and says, oh, by the way, you're going to be pregnant. I know you're not married yet. I know you haven't been with anybody yet, but you're going to be pregnant. Oh, wow, that sounds like I'm highly favored. I can't wait for everybody in my community to talk about me with all the rumors already stirring in the hearts of people. That doesn't sound very highly favored. Or she looks back down the road as she's going the 80-mile journey uh, from Nazareth to Bethlehem and riding on a donkey nine months pregnant because she's got to go and register in the town of David. I imagine in her mind she must have been thinking, highly favored, huh? This doesn't feel very highly favored, making an 80-mile trip nine months pregnant. I'm not sure that sounds very highly favored. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have a baby, but it's not going to be born in a nice, clean home or a situation. You're going to be in a little stable, and you're going to wrap that, your firstborn child, in swaddling clothes. Well, great. When does the highly favored part come in? That's what I'd like to know, because none of this is sounding highly favored. Well, in several months, uh, King Herod is going to be after you, and particularly the baby, and you're going to have to escape down to Egypt and spend a few years down there in a foreign land that you're not familiar with. Great. Is that now finally do we get to highly favored? No, not really. And oh, by the way, this new husband, now you get to do all this with your new husband and try to work out the relationship dynamics in the midst of all this. And I imagine that Mary had to have been thinking, when do I get highly favored? Because <laughs> none of this sounds highly favored. And what amazes me is really Mary's faith that I never really thought of before because we never hear of Mary complaining about any of this. In fact, her comment was, okay, 
do as you see fit. As God sees fit, I am still going to worship. Even though all of this is going on, even anybody from the outside looking in would go, this is a horrible situation to be in. Mary says, I'm still going to follow you, God. I'm still going to do what you want. I'm a willing participant in this. And that's what really our series has been for the month of December, which, frankly, if you want to dig into that a little bit more, you can go on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook and, and get into these. But we looked at different characters of Scripture and said, even though this happened in their life, they still have this defiant, uh, supernatural kind of faith that stands regardless of circumstances of life. And what I said is, I want a faith more like that. And I imagine because you're here tonight, some of you would like a faith like that, a faith that works in the real world. When stuff happens, then I still have this trust that God is still in control of things. And so how can you have that kind of faith? That's what I want to unpack a little bit for you. And to do that, I want to go in the Old Testament. There's a book called the Psalms, uh, just a whole bunch of different writings, mostly from King David, but a lot of other uh, people. And here's what I want to share with you. Look at verse um, 1. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. For you have set your glory in the heavens. I love that perspective. And frankly, I guess there's a couple of things that you can do with that perspective. You can have that kind of perspective, or you could have a perspective uh, like Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan said this when he considered the universe. He said, the universe is a pretty big place. Uh, if it's just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. <laughs> Man, I, I sort of get that. I mean, if that's your vantage point, like you just look at the, the universe and the galaxies and all the planets and stars and as far as you can go and we keep exploring and finding new areas in space, it does seem like an awful waste of space. Or you can have the perspective of astronaut Neil Armstrong who said this, it suddenly struck me that that tiny pea, pretty and blue, was the earth. It didn't, I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. You can look at the same thing and have a different perspective. Two different approaches to looking at the same truth. The psalmist goes on to write, verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Here's one of the things I absolutely love uh, about Christmas is Christmas is, is just a wonderful time to consider. It's just a wonderful time to think and, and just consider and, and stop and pause a little bit from the hecticness of life because a, a lot of you, Frank, are going to have some time. You've got time off of work. Um, you've got some time that, that you just need to, to burn, um, vacation time or whatnot, and you've got days that you're going to have some time to just stop and consider. Some of you are having relatives over at your house. Maybe some of them are, are here already. And, and you're going to think at some point, like, I need a break from these people who are in my house. Christmas is a wonderful time to consider. Get out of the house for a moment and consider. I can still remember being a little boy. I was probably about the age my daughter is now, six or seven years old. And, and we were fortunate enough growing up in a home where uh, we had a, a Christmas tree and there were presents under the Christmas tree. Now, I don't know about you, um, but growing up in school, I know I said several times, I'm never going to need to know this. <laughs> Why do I need to learn this? Anybody else ever utter those kind of words at some point throughout school? Like, why, why do I need, I'm never ever going to use this. Well, let me tell you, one of the things that you used, at least I did, was math. Because math I used on that Christmas, I still remember under the tree because I remember I had an older sister and a younger brother. And I remember we're all opening up presents and I'm counting in my mind. She's got so many, my brother's got so many, I got so many. And at the end of the unwrapping of the Christmas mess, um, I didn't have as many as my brother and sister. And in my little six or seven year old mind, that's unfair. Like, that is a wrong that has to be righted. And I didn't know what to do with that, so I did what a lot of kids do at that point. You just sort of leave, and you go mope by yourself for a little while. So I went off to another room and moped by myself, and my mom evidently clued in on what was going on. She came over, and, hey, John, what's going on? And I said, well, I didn't get as many gifts as Jennifer and Jeff got. 
And she goes, John, we, we spent the same amount of money. I could show you the receipts. You got some gifts that were more expensive than your brother and sister. So you didn't get as many gifts, but we spent the same amount of money. And evidently that wasn't registering in my little brain, and nor did that really make a difference in that moment in my brain. And so she evidently was clued in on that. And she goes, well, let me tell you something else, John. We love giving all of you gifts. And so please don't rob our joy by sitting over here by yourself. Why don't you come and be with the rest of the family? And I'll never forget that little conversation with me as a little boy because it gave me some time to consider at Christmas that maybe Christmas is more uh, than just gathering and getting a whole bunch of toys and a whole bunch of presents. Maybe Christmas is more than just revolving around me, that maybe there is a, a great joy in giving gifts, and maybe there's a great joy in understanding that we have a God who has given us everything. So Christmas is a great time to consider. And I just invite you to maybe uh, step outside a little bit and just do some star gazing. The moon is absolutely beautiful um, now. This is amazing to go out there and just look. But would you take some time and just consider, like the psalmist, when I, when I look at the heavens, Lord, and all that you've created, would you just wonder again? Verse 6 of the psalm. You made them, God. Who's them? We are them, us, his creation. You made them rulers over the works of your hands, and you put everything under their feet. I love this, because what God is saying in this moment is, you're in charge. I don't know about you, I, I sort of like being in charge. There's something about that. I think something in all of us likes to be left in charge. When we're little kids, we can't wait. When can I be left alone? When can you leave me at home? And we love those words. If you're the older brother or sister, well, you're in charge. Yay! I remember uh, at Little Caesars, I was 16 years old and working at Little Caesars, and uh, the manager at that time evidently saw something in me and said, well, I'm going to make you uh, an assistant manager. Or, or maybe it was assistant to the manager. I don't know what uh, that was. But at some point, I got a different color shirt. And what that meant is I was now responsible. And I thought, wow, this is wonderful. And I remember the first night that I was leading uh, the shift that night. And so at about 10 o'clock at night, one of the other employees who was there with me, he was supposed to get off about 10. He said, hey, John, it's 10 o'clock. Is it all right if I punch out and go home? And I'm thinking, oh, well, yeah, you're supposed to get off at 10. Why don't you go home? And uh, what I didn't realize is after he left, as I walked into the back part of the store, is that he had left all the dishes um, not washed or cleaned yet, so there's still a mound of dishes in the back, and none of the prep had been done for the next day. And so I'm there by myself realizing, wow, I'm in charge, I'm responsible, and now this is all my fault if I leave it this way. So I stayed there for like three hours after close the first time, and it dawned on me that maybe before I let people go, I should probably make sure that they've done some work, because I'm going to be the last person standing. We're all responsible, God says. And so when we look at the foundation and the condition of our earth, who gets the blame for what's going on, for, for the evil and for the anger and, and for the hatred? Who gets the blame for that? Well, we get the blame for that. And so Christmas really is a reminder of that great reality because what we have is a world that we can't fix. When we talk about trying to fix it, man, what would it be like? I want world peace, and if only we could just get along. If we could just do this, the world would be fine. The world won't be fine. We can't fix it. We don't have the ability to fix this. Christmas is a reminder of that reality that the world is broken, we're responsible, and we can't fix it. It's like my little daughter on Saturday, we're wrapping up some gifts, and and we're in there, and, and at some point, I don't remember her doing this, but she had taken, she had one of these long, like two feet long Disney pens. You ever seen these kind of huge pens? And she had taken the whole thing apart. And, and I'd, evidently, there's like a billion parts in this thing. I didn't know pens could have so many different parts in this. But she brought it in her little hands to me, and oh, here. And then she kept bringing me more parts. Here, here's some more parts, and here's some more. Dad, I, I can't put it back together. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, this is a great opportunity for Dad. All right, great. And so I, I start looking. I'm like, man, I've never seen. So I, and I'm trying to put things back together, and it dawns. I'm like, I don't know how this pen goes back together. I'm not sure I can figure this out. There's only a certain number of combinations. There's got to be a way to do this. And so I'm fudging with this thing for about a half an hour. I'm this close away from YouTubing how to put a Disney pen back together because I'm like, I am so, and finally, click, hey, it works. And I give it back to my daughter. 
after that little experiment. And she did exactly what a seven-year-old should do. I hand her the pen, and she goes, oh, thanks, Dad. I don't know what I was expecting in my mind, um, but I was maybe a little bit more than thanks, Dad. Like, wow, Dad, you are amazing. You can fix anything. Thank you. Maybe hallelujah chorus, something in the background that, wow, I can't wait to tell all my friends how wonderful. And just the little thank you evidently wasn't enough. And I remember sitting there in that moment thinking, I wonder if this is sort of the way God feels, <laughs> that God comes into our world, <laughs> enters into our mess, and, and we have a hard time just, oh, thanks, God. I, I, I came. I created the whole world. I came in the form of a little baby. I, I, I lived a whole sinless life. I taught you everything I possibly could. I opened up the door for you to experience me. And, and I shared my love with you. And I demonstrated that for you. I died on a cross and I rose again. Oh, thanks, God. What I love about the Christmas story is God isn't expecting Great thank yous for, from us. But this is what John was writing about in his gospel in John chapter 1. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. But what a sad commentary on life. God comes to fix the mess, comes into the world. You can't do it on your own. I'm going to do it for you. I come into the world, and the world doesn't recognize him, and the world doesn't receive him. And, and this is where, if you've tuned out, uh, please just come back for a second, because I don't want you to miss um, this point. Because above all else, Christmas is a great time to come home. Regardless if you've never, for a moment of your life, been thankful for the love that God has for you. If you've never uh, uttered a prayer of appreciation. If you've never stopped and reflected. And Christmas is a great time to come home. Because there's no greater opportunity for us to see the love of God than God says, I will enter into the world. And I'll, I'll give myself for you. You don't have to say thank you. You don't have to clean up your life first and then. God just says, welcome home. Several Christmases ago, there was a guy uh, who was worshiping with us. And after everybody left, uh, he was still sitting in the back all by himself. Everybody else had gone. And I'm not the most intuitive person in the world. Um, and my wife would tell you, I, you know, sometimes I don't pick up on clues, you know, with the empathy kind of thing, and here's somebody. That need. But when somebody is sitting Christmas Eve all by themselves after everybody has left, he might need somebody to talk to. So I go up and sit next to him. I said, hey, need somebody to talk to? And he just started breaking down. He's like, man, do you suppose that God can still do something with me. I said, what, what do you mean? What's going on? He said, man, I've made a mess of my life. My, my family uh, has now left me, and I deserve it. And he went on to describe his story. I won't repeat all of that here. And he said, my life is a wreck. I've made my life a wreck, and I'm just searching for some reason to just go on. Do you suppose God can still use me, and does God still love me? I said, man, there are a lot of questions in life I don't have an answer to, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has a plan for you and that you are, are welcome home tonight. In fact, I, I believe the reason you walked through the doors of a church where you didn't know anybody and the reason you sat here after everybody left is because there was something that God was holding you here until you got a chance to hear from somebody that you are welcome home. That might not fix everything in your life. You might have done some damage to your family that never can be repaired, but there's always hope, and you're always, always, always welcome home. And the reason I know that is because that's what Scripture reveals to us. Look at verse 12. Yet all who did receive him, that's a gift. Anybody who just received that gift, to those who believe in his 
name he gave the right to become the children of God. He gave the right to become the children of God. So even though I've made a mess of my life, man, even though I've never spent a moment really being thankful for God, I've never taken time to seriously consider what Jesus has done for me, even though I've done all of this, God still came because God so dearly loves you. Christmas is a great time to come home. We're going to start a series in January, and it's simply just called Home. We want to spend a month just getting our mind around that and inviting people that have been far away from God. You are welcome to come home. I hope if you're here tonight and you feel like you're a billion miles away from God, that I'm not even sure I just came because this is what my family wanted to do tonight. And I want you to know that God has a better plan for your life. You are welcome home tonight. God wants to welcome you. God wants you home. He wants you to be his son. He wants you to be his daughter. You don't have to do anything to earn it or deserve it. God just says simply, you are welcome home.